Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for another insightful webinar. My name is Vilena. I'm the Partnerships Manager at NitroPack, and I'm delighted to be the moderator of today's event. It's a pleasure to reunite with familiar faces for a third webinar on the business impact of Core Web Vitals. The past sessions have sparked rich conversations and insights, and today promises to follow suit as we explore the most challenging metric, largest content full paint, or LCP. Allow me to introduce our speakers. Today, I'm joined by Barry Pollard, who is a developer relations engineer at Google, Adam Silverstein, who is a developer relations engineer at Google as well, and Yvailo Christov, who is the co-founder and CTO of NitroPack. Welcome back, guys. It's always a joy having your expertise and insights on board. Hello. Nice being here as well. Awesome. So what are we going to talk about in the next hour? We'll start with a quick overview of LCP, covering the fundamentals of the loading metric. Then Barry and Adam will take us on a journey through the recent updates in LCP, with a special nod to the WordPress enthusiasts among us. You're in for a treat. After that, we'll tackle the burning question that's been keeping 42% of site owners up at night. Why is LCP so hard to optimize for? And then to round things off, Evai will pull back the curtain on different optimizations that will allow you to pass LCP. You want to stick around until the end because we have a Q&A session that you don't want to miss. It's your opportunity to get those LCP questions answered directly by our experts. And with that said, I think it's time to turn our attention to our first speaker. Barry, the virtual stage is all yours. Hello, everybody. I'm going to give a quick summary of LCP. I'm presuming a lot of you that have joined are aware of this, so I'll keep it reasonably brief. I think LCP's been out there for a little while, um, and hopefully the fact that you're joining this webinar means that you're at least aware of it. Um, but as a reminder, LCP, or Largest Contentful Paint, is one of three metrics that Google launched uh, just over three years ago now um, as part of their Core Web Vitals initiative. And these are metrics used to measure the loading experiences or the user experience of, of people visiting your website. LCP is measures the load of your website, which is something we traditionally done with web performance circles for a while. But rather than measuring some um, weird uh, backend uh, metric that only the browser knows, this is supposed to be user centric. So it measures what the user would um, foresee as the page being loaded. And we do that by measuring, as the name suggests, when the largest bit of content is loaded. And as well as the metric, we give um, a couple of thresholds. So if um, your largest content loads in 2.5 seconds or under, we consider that a good user experience. Um, at the same time, if it takes more than four seconds, we consider that a poor user experience. And in between, we say that eh, needs improvement. It's not, not too bad, but uh, it can certainly be optimized. Um, so LCP, as I say, is the largest bit of content. So it could be a number of different HTML elements on that. Images are quite typical. So um, hero images on an article, for example. Um, image elements with an SVG, for those using the SVG elements, also count. Um, an element with a background image. So some people don't use image elements. They'll use a div with a background image. Again, we take those into account. If the image is loaded with a URL, if you're using a CSS gradient, then typically it's not contentful. So we kind of ignore those sorts of things. Uh, text is another big uh, component of, uh, that could be potentially your LCP elements. So block level elements, that could be a paragraph, a large paragraph, or it could be your H1 header text. Um, those say typically you see the H1 or the uh, back hero images as a typical LCP element. Um, more recently, and we'll get into this in a minute, um, we started including uh, video elements and also animated, we made some changes to animated elements. So those ones tend to take a little bit longer to draw. So um, for your user's uh, um, benefit and also for the metrics benefit, um, try not to make those the, the most important bit of content you arrive. Typically, they're better slightly below the screen, uh, which you get a bit more chance for them to load. Um, important thing to realize is that there is no automatic way of figuring out what the LCP element is. It will change as the page loads. So the browser is kind of continually watching the page and seeing this. Here we see a CNN web page. It starts to render in different stages. So initially, the menu bar shows, and we say, hey, there's an LCP element. Then the header comes in, and we say, oh, that's bigger. That's the LCP element. Then some more text come in, but that's not bigger, so we might not do anything there. Some images start to drop in. Again, they're all, mostly off screen, so they're not bigger than what we've already done. 
And then finally, maybe another image comes in and then that's what the LCP element does. So this is what Chrome, the browser does, is it's continually watching there. As new elements are drawn, it sits there and says, okay, is this bigger than what I've already done? Uh, and then we're happy. When the user interacts with the page, um, scrolls down, clicks on a button or whatever, they, that tends to change the elements. So at that point, we stop recording. And we're now, we've got a finalized LCP element. And that's what gets reported back there. Um, on a similar note, your LCP element can be different on different screen sizes. Here we see the UK government web page. Um, in both cases, the LCP element is text, but in the mobile page, it's a paragraph and it's slightly larger than the H1 element, um, which on desktop is drawn quite larger. So you, you might see, I mean, in this case, it may not matter too much. The text is like drawn together, but you might notice on um, some uh, mobile pages, maybe it's your uh, text, whereas on desktop, it's a large image. You need to be aware that there is no one uh, LCP element. And similarly, when people visit your website, some of them may um, visit um, anchor links further down the page. Therefore, they may get a slightly different LCP element. So it's quite important to understand different LCP elements that you get rather than say that's the one. And this goes back to something that we talked about in a previous webinar, that performance is a distribution and not a single number. Many people will get all sorts of different LCP elements, different times, depending on whether they've got the latest and greatest phone or whether they've got a slow network uh, um, that they're on. And we measure all these different distributions and then we take the 75th percentile. So what did 75% of your users get or better? And we say that's a broad indication of what most of your users got as an LCP or better. You can see in this chart, a large number of people got a considerably better LCP than the one that we've taken as a 70th percentile. And similarly, 25% um, of people may have got a considerably worse experience there. We're saying this is a broad indicator of what your website feels like to load. And there's many tools to measure LCP. Um, here's some of the Google tools, but there's many third party tools as well as top of these. PageSpeed Insight is a very easy way to get a, a quick insight into your page and your uh, site as a whole. Google Search Console lists all your pages and, and um, tries to group them to give uh, LCP times for each of them. Crux dashboard is another way. And I'll not go through all these things. But one important point is here is because of the reasons I explained earlier, LCP is really best measured in the tool, in, in the field. You can use a number of tools, Lighthouse is another common one, and it will give a, for this load, your LCP element was here. But for someone with a slightly different screen size or who maybe got cookie banner or a pop-up or a special offer, they may experience a different LCP element there. So by measuring all those different experiences in the field and seeing there, we can get a, a broader indicator than just one run through a tool would give. And um, with that, there's been a couple of changes, uh, well, more than a couple, there's been a few changes to the LCP um, definition since we launched and, uh, and also some changes to um, how WordPress deals with LCP elements. So Adam and I are going to take you through these now. I'll talk about first uh, uh, about some of the changes that Chrome have made to the LCP definition and then Adam will talk through how WordPress is dealing with these. Um, so since we launched LCP as a core web vital, uh, as I say, 2020, so just got, uh, three years ago, um, these are the major changes we made. We made some bug fixes and, and uh, tweaks as well. These, but these are the main things that will affect these. Um, fairly early on, we decided to emit um, opacity zero images. So this is where you set CSS opacity zero, which in effect makes the image invisible. The image can't be seen by the user. It's not really contentful. Um, so we exclude those um, from Chrome 86. Um, similarly, from Chrome 88, you may not be aware of this one, but we also exclude full screen images. Those are typically background images. And although they may be a nice photograph or something like that, um, it's not really typically the content that users come to. Now, there are some exceptions to this. Instagram is a, a well-known example where you're coming there for the image itself. Um, but if it's taking up the whole viewport, so that's the whole width and the whole height, then we'll not consider that as an LCP element and we'll say there's something else in the content that you really want to include. More recently, in Chrome 1112, we started making a change to exclude low entry images. Now, what that means is if you've got a very simple image, um, and again, people had some people were trying to cheat the metric and putting a uh, very simple pixel spread out to the whole page and set to a very low opacity, not quite zero, but uh, just low. And it wasn't really the content, it was uh, hidden there. Or if you have a large square gray block on the page, that's not really contentful. So we've started excluding those. We run a mathematical calculation to see how complicated the image is. And if you don't meet a certain threshold, then we say, okay, what's the next biggest 
element on the page that we can consider as LCP. And as I mentioned recently, um, in Chrome 116, we've made a number of changes. Um, first of all, we started including videos. Previously, we included videos that used a, a poster image, which is basically the still image that you get before the, the uh, video loads. But now we actually look at videos themselves. So again, if you're still using the poster image, we'll still use that. That's the load time. But this. If there is no poster image, previously that element would be completely adored and we'll pick the next largest element. But if it is the largest element, we'll look at that and we'll look at when the first frame loads. So videos typically stream. You don't want to wait till the whole video is there. The user can use it before then. So we'll look when the first frame uh, comes in there. But videos can be quite slow. So um, if you have a, a screen that is just a video um, on that, you really got a question if that's the best UX for your user. If you're um, a website like YouTube or Vimo or some of the video site, clearly it is, that's their concept. Um, and most of them have a poster image to start. But if you're um, any other site, do you want a user staring at a gray box for five, 10 seconds before the content comes in there? Or is it better for that video to load silently afterwards or further down the page while uh, you give it a chance to load as a set? Um, similarly on that, we also changed um, animated uh, images or GIFs, uh, pronounced GIFs by the way, not GIFs. Um, is, so we used to wait for the whole thing to load, now we look at the first frame again, because it's kind of similar to the video use case there. That's a small use case. That should actually make it easier for anyone to use those, but they're rare enough as LCP candidates. And finally, we're also trying to make it life easier for you. So Adam's going to talk a little bit about what WordPress does, but Chrome itself is also trying to look there. So it, what it does, um, we've tried some experiments there where we traditionally we hold off images until we know that they're needed. We're now starting to load them a little bit earlier and we're a slightly higher priority. So we'll look at the first sort of biggish images and say some of these are probably LCP images and try to start them earlier. So you might notice that things suddenly have got better despite you not making any changes. Um, you're welcome. Um, and with that, I'll pass on to uh, Adam. We can talk more about the, the WordPress ecosystem and how they're dealing with the LCP metric. Adam, take it away. Great. Thanks, Barry. And, and thanks for the nuances about LCP and also for settling once and for all the controversy about how to pronounce GIF. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be going over changes in the last few releases of WordPress. Some of these are not like LCP, LCP specific, but because LCP is kind of uh, affected by a lot of different things, they will improve LCP overall. So um, a big change for WordPress really is that we have a new focus on performance. In the last year and a half, we've added a performance team and we now have leads, performance leads for each release that are doing benchmarking and making sure that we're not regressing. Um, we've added automated performance testing so that every commit that we make gets a, a performance test run. And as a result, we've seen really huge improvements in just baseline performance of how quickly WordPress loads uh, and, and, and even front end performance. So you can see in the little graph there that we're getting like we're up to now 34% pass rate of WordPress sites in the you know Core Web Vitals metrics overall, which is a big improvement from 30% at, at 6.0. Um, overall, we have seen that block themes are are improving faster than classic themes, and perhaps uh, that's because of the way they're structured and their ability to kind of know the content uh, ahead of time because of how they're actually built. Um, but we do hope to focus more on classic themes since they are still the largest, you know, 98 or 9 percent of themes are still classic themes. Um, and I would encourage you to check out the Performance Lab plugin, which is our uh, the performance team's uh, kind of experiment area where we're trying out new features for core. So pretty much anything we're going to test, if possible, we try to test it first in the plugin before merging it into core. So just to go back over some of the changes, we added a WebP support all the way back in version 5.8. And you can actually have WordPress output WebP as your default image format when you upload JPEG images uh, with a plugin. Um, with WebP, you're going to get about a 30% reduction in, in image size for the same quality image. And that's going to be for all your images, not just your LCP image. So I would highly recommend looking at that um, unless you have some special circumstances. It's really uh, broadly compatible with all browsers. Hopefully, we'll see AVIF also come into play in the next year. We're sort of waiting on Edge uh, to adopt support for it because we don't really adopt support in core for things unless they're additive or are supported by all the browsers. There've been quite a few, I would call low hanging fruit, time to first bite improvements that we've made in core. The whole caching layer has been improved with uh, multi-cache get and set. Um, we've added caching where it was missing in the past. We've taken a look at some of the really high frequency 
CodePass, like all the filtering that we run that can run thousands and thousands of times on a page load and just made small improvements to those. But those improvements have added up to a significant improvement overall in time to first byte, which of course is going to affect LCP and a lot of other metrics. Uh, and it is something we see in the WordPress ecosystem that we've kind of performed poorly on. So it's something that there's definitely still room uh, to improve. Um, of course, people should be running full page caching ideally and serving their pages, you know, already generated, but you're still going to have play times when your cache is cold and where WordPress needs to generate that page for you. And that's where like the core part has to be as lean and, and as efficient as possible. Um, we added automatic native HTML lazy loading in back in WordPress 5.5 for images and 5.7 for iframes. So this basically is taking advantage of the new feature that browsers have to do lazy loading where previously you'd have to use JavaScript. So this is going to prevent things that are way off the screen, you know, that the user may never scroll to from even loading. And as they scroll down, then, then it will start to load. Um, when we first released this, the, the logic that we used wasn't that great. And we wound up marking quite a few images that were actually in the viewport as lazy loading, which is not what you want to do. It has actually a negative effect on performance. So over the last several releases, this is something we've been improving. So dealing with all the edge cases, the different ways that people insert images programmatically with the editor in template files, we've been dealing with all those scenarios to try to really do a better job uh, identifying which images should be marked uh, for lazy loading, we've, we've become a little more conservative about it. So now we'll sort of let a few images not have lazy loading. The real goal is to avoid the lazy loading for things that are in the viewport. Um, but this basically, by having lazy loading for all those other elements that are hopefully out of the viewport, just reduces the load of what the browser has to do to get to that initial display. So it's it, even though it may not be directly related to the LCP image, it's still going to help. Um, and it is possible to, to manually control lazy loading. So if you have a situation where you're building a theme or you've designed a page where you know something shouldn't be lazy loaded, um, you can actually mark that using a plugin or using code, and Core will respect that. Um, similarly, in, in uh, 6.3, we added fetch priority, where we're trying to mark the LCP image with fetch priority high. And this gives a signal to the browser early that it should prioritize loading this image. Of course, the browser at some point will discover, once it does the layout, which, which is the biggest element. But hopefully, we're giving it a hint here that you know this is the image you should prioritize. We are making this guess at what the hint should be, which element it should be on the server side during the page render. So it's not 100% accurate. And we do hope to improve this over time. We've already discovered some edge cases where we're not making the correct uh, decision. Um, ultimately, to make the right decision, you would need some sort of front end to back end connection. And that is also something we're experimenting with. But for now, it's, it's strictly based on the, the server side. And again, there is a plugin you can use uh, or in code where you can add your fetch priority. Like if you know this image is always going to be the, the LCP image, you can mark that as fetch priority high. And then Core will, will uh, recognize that and, and not try to mark another image. So you can sort of manually control this as well. Um, and then I think this is my last one. We added the script strategy feature in the, in 6.3 as well. And this is just a way for WordPress developers to easily add defer async when they enqueue scripts through our normal scripts API. Um, previously, you could do this, but it was a sort of a hacky way of doing it. And um, the, the core API also has a great feature where it, it looks at dependencies of your script and it makes sure that like if you have a defer script and other scripts depend on it that aren't deferred, uh, that your first script isn't deferred to avoid out of order execution. So it, it helps with backwards compatibility. The previous approach uh, was a little risky for plugins to do. Now we're hoping to see more adoption of this. And this can really overall help you know, with how WordPress sites perform, I think. Um, and we already are, are seeing some, you know, quite a few plugins have already adopted it. So that's pretty exciting to see. And I think that brings me to the end of my section. And we're on to the discussion. Awesome. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I think now that we've covered what LCP is all about and the latest changes to the metric, we should dive into the first interactive segment of today's event. I'm saying the first because we'll actually have two. Now, we know that LCP is the hardest core web vitals to optimize for, and I know I can't be the only one wondering why that is. So I'm sure we'd all love to hear your guys' thought, your guys's thoughts on that. Yep. Yeah, can, uh, I, can I do... Oh, sorry, Roger. Oh, no worry. Yeah, uh, I was about to say that we covered uh, so many things, and uh, I, I think this is a good indicator that the LCP is a very complex metric. Like, uh, a lot goes into it, a lot can influence it. Uh, so, that's why it's probably considered the, the hardest, or it just has a, uh, the least pass rate uh, that we see. 
So definitely lots of moving parts and we can talk uh, uh, about all of them. And uh, does anybody, uh, Barry, I think you want to say something? Yeah, I was going to start off with uh, the question. Why is LSQ the hardest core of battle to optimize for? Um, because it depends on your definition of hardest. So by mm. pure pass rates, yes, LCP is the, the one that most sites are struggling with. Um, and I think even we're talking about bringing it where we're going to replace FID with IMP, which is a lot more complex. So that's one definition of hard, a lot more tough to fix. Um, it even has a higher pass rate than, um, than LCP. So LCP is one that most sites are finding hard to actually fix there. Um, and I think it's a bit strange in some ways because it's probably the one that was most understood. CLS, whenever it was launched, was very new. We'd never tried to measure that before. Though the fixes can be relatively simple and, and once you fix them, they tend to go. LCP, as I talked about earlier, can change different people and understanding that concept is, is quite um, complex. Um, my view on the question of why most sites struggle with it is a lot of it is out of your control. Um, so if it's just a matter of getting your markup right or doing some of the things that Adam talked about there and you know marking the LCP image with fetch priority, not lazy loading and stuff like that, that's relatively easy and, and we can do that or we can get platforms like WordPress to do it. Um, but some of it is outside of your control. So we measure LCP from when you click on a link or type in the URL in the Chrome bar or, or click it from your bookmark until the page loads. And some of those links, if it's an ad, might go through several redirects before it even starts in your page. And you may only be in control of that bit whenever it finally lands in your page and going through three different ad networks or going that, or if you send out a newsletter and you're using a bit.ly link or any other type of other URL shortener, um, those are steps that all have to go through that can feel out of your control. But at the same time, they're also steps that the user experiences. So it's not right to just ignore them and say, okay, well, only bit under your control is a bit we should measure. That's why we measure the whole time. But it does make it very complicated. And similarly, if you have a website that is served to, um, uh, you know, uh, rich countries, Western countries with uh, fast internets, um, compared to Ireland, where I'm from, where there's a lot of the bits of rural Ireland where the internet isn't the fastest thing, um, or other um, slower countries, stuff like that, that can again be more difficult. So if you're a tech blog website, you've probably got lots of readers who are on the latest tech and very fast and, and have an easy time passing LCP. Um, whereas if your audience is a much more global nature or for rural Irish farmers or whatever, then you might struggle to, to meet your LCP things. And again, it can feel annoying because it's somewhat out of your control. Um, but again, it is what users are experiencing. So I think that's why it's hard is you can't just go in and magically fix these things. You need to see, understand what your audience is, what the problem is itself. And is it something on your page and on the site or is it something um, more about how the people are getting to your site? Yeah, I definitely agree with this. And as you mentioned, a lot of this is out of your control. And uh, I think for uh, a good LCP, a lot of effort needs to go in. Uh, you. Although LCP is kind of very well understood and all of the moving parts, we know about them, it's still not easy to understand where the problem is. So you gave a very nice example where you, uh, for example, the majority of your uh, user base is like uh, Irish farmers, all right? So they might be on uh, slower connections. And if you design your website uh, in a way that uh, it works well with faster internet, everything is good, and your LCP is, uh, is great there. Uh, it might be just that if this is your core audience, you might have to rethink your website. So that's a, that's an effort and you need to know that. You need to figure out uh, who is using your website and where they, uh, what their conditions are, what is the typical uh, network condition, the typical device, things like that. Uh, so it's not like uh, the other metrics where you can uh, load the page on your device, figure out what's wrong, fix it and know that it's, uh, the fix is going to be essentially uh, roughly the same for everybody. Uh, LCP is just a lot of moving parts, a lot of uh, like dynamic elements, like the network drops, for example, you're uh, on your mobile device and you go into the subway and uh, your internet connection becomes just spotty or it uh, drops altogether. So things like that, you, you have 
uh, out of your control, and you have to think about. It. Um, yeah, and I think I think that's great. I think that's brilliant the way that the core of vitals program um, does that. If you are serving, I'm giving Ireland a bad name here, but to rural <laughs> Irish farmers and they have spotty connections, you don't want to create a 50 megabyte React site that um, is not going to work for them. If you're doing a Google Maps type um, thing that's used for navigating the subway, you might want to use service workers and be able to have an offline experience and present your LCP content and then uh, up, uh, quickly, even if offline, and then update it whenever you've got network connection and stuff like that. So it's really making you think about your users and what you what they want out of your website rather than your developers of I like to use the latest and greatest framework and I'm going to not care about my users. So I think that's, that's a hugely positive thing, even though, as I say, being the other end of it and being a web diver, de developer and having to fix some of these LCP issues can feel a little frustrating and annoying and, oh, Google, why are you doing this to me? I love, yeah. I love uh, how you always bring it back to the user, Barry. That's that's like the most important thing about Core Web Vitals, really. These are user-focused metrics, even though they're numbers that we're looking at. We're really talking about how do users experience the site. I think you guys said it all, but what I was going to say about why it's so complicated is just that there's so many factors that go into LCP, right? Like it could be scripts that are blocking. It could be that your image is giant. It could be that you've got a slow internet connection. It could be that your caching is messed up. There's so many different layers that can contribute to LCP that it makes it harder to reason about and think about like, what is the thing I need to do to fix this? Um, which I think you guys already said, but I, I just wanted to sort of reiterate that point for me. That's that's why. And I also would like to say that I, I like metrics that we don't pass. Metrics where everyone passes are not very useful. Having something where you have room to improve gives you something to work on. Um, so I, I think it's great that we have, like you said, this complete cycle of the page. Otherwise, you wouldn't really be able to understand that as a website owner or developer. Yeah. And, and I think we're moving in the direction where uh, we are kind of going to probably make it uh, an easier problem to solve with the more and more tools uh, for run data that are popping up and we just gain more insight on where the problem is. And uh, I think one of, I'm probably going to repeat myself, but one of the hardest things is to understand what exactly is not going uh, right for my user base, for my users. So if we have this insight, the problem becomes less challenging and we can easily say okay we have this and this action items and if we do this we're uh, going to fix this and that problem and that improves the situation but if we are uh, essentially driving blind and we're uh, just trying things out and we're not sure why this is uh, the case why lcp is uh, not great it's a lot harder to to make the the right fixes and uh, the right improvements in order to uh, see improvement in your LCP for the users, right? Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think the other thing the core of that initiative has moved is, as I talked about with the user, is the move to, to run data, to real user metric data, whether that be the Chrome user experience report or a, a dedicated run solution. So not saying, oh, well, I put it through this web performance tool, uh, including Lighthouse. I love Lighthouse. It gives you lots of good information, but far too many people depended on that or said, seen in the chat here, oh, forget 90 scores and Lighthouse, is that good? I don't know. Is that reflective of your users? Um, so moving to the actual runs um, and measuring it from that. And I like HP Insight, which show you your run scores and then some diagnostic information from Lighthouse underneath. I think we need much more tools to move there, try and help you understand um, your LCP and what it is the, the difference is. Is the stuff that Lighthouse is showing you going to help with that? Or is it, it's got the wrong end of the stick and your users are all fast and it's on a slow test, so the stuff might not be as relevant. Um, and I think more tooling needs to come into that. Um, we've talked a lot about it internally at Google, how we can bring more of the wrong tooling into um, more like dev tools or whatever, or how we can use that. So, um, and then also how we can use RUM to actually help us answer these questions. So at the minute we're at stage one where RUM is telling you you've got a problem. Um, and in the last year or two, we've tried to move to stage two where we can give you the attribution of that problem. It's a problem because of redirect or it's a problem because of large image or whatever. So try and give that next stage. And I think we're still in the middle of that stage. And I'd like to see more RUM providers come up with that and more tools come up with that to help us kind of break down what the problem is rather than going, RUM says I've got a problem, lab gives me lots of details, it may or may not correlate. Um, can we merge and join those gaps a little bit better? Absolutely, yeah.
uh, it is also something that we've seen on our end uh, while working on NitroPack. Uh, we, we definitely see that uh, examining RAM data gives us uh, a lot better overview and pushes us in the better direction comparing to only relying on uh, the lab tools. Uh, so I, I do think we are uh, soon going to have a lot more insight from third party tools or Barry, probably from Google. So uh, having a, a well, more so insight is going to make the problem easier to solve, right? Well, yeah, as I say, we've given you Crux, the Chrome user experience report, and we've made that freely available and lots of tooling that is based upon that, including our tools and, and external. Um, and we're quite happy for people to use that. But as a public data set, we're limited with that, mm. what we can do with that. Um, we, it, it, there's business sensitive uh, issues, there's privacy issues and stuff like that. So we can give overall summary of your website was good or your website was poor to say, the poor people were clicking on this particular button is a level of detail that we can't go into with the Chrome user experience support um, because that would give, you know, too, uh, it would give information that shouldn't really be made on the public data set. Um, so that does leave a challenge there of, okay, as I say, Crux has told me there's a problem. What's the solution or what, what's the reason? Um, whereas monitoring your own ROM, either through a commercial ROM product or um, through the web APIs or the web vitals library that I look after, um, allows you to get a bit more detail than Crux can of those sorts of things that are very specific to your site and aren't going to be made in the public data set. Mm, yep. And probably one other aspect of, of, of this is uh, like for the modern web, I think is more and more common for people to be using external services on their website to provide functionality, right? So uh, you're also very dependent on those services. So also make sure that you're tracking the performance of those. And if something is not uh, performing well, you should be raising an alarm with the team of, this, uh, of, this, of the solution because otherwise you might, have, uh, you might be completely out of control uh, if you want to keep using this service, and if if that's if that thing is slow and it's affecting your LCP or whatever other metric, uh, uh, so it's, if it's impacting your user experience, you have to contact the the developer and uh, push towards making this uh, faster, push towards making this better. Absolutely, and um, I'm well aware, by the way, that some of those plugins or, or embeds that we use come from Google themselves. And we're a large team at Google, and if I was in charge of them all, I'd make them concentrate and perform as much more. But they, you know, we've got different priorities. They need to do that. But yeah, the more um, and the more third parties you put on there, um, one plugin might be fine, and it's it's great even if it's not the, the most performant plugin. Ten or twenty of them, they start clashing with each other and holding things up, maybe delaying your LCP, certainly impacting your IMP, and, and or shifting stuff around, affecting your CLS. So. Absolutely, you know, you can need to look there. And I hate people saying, well, it's a third party or it's Google's widget. I don't care. What can I do about it? And, you know, it's out of my control. And I'd say it's not. It's your website. It's something there. You need to decide if the value of that embed or that plug is worth it. Or if there's any workarounds you can do. The classic example I always give is I've seen sites who have a, I don't know, Google Maps on their Contact Us page but they load the Google Maps SDK on every single page, even though they're only using the map on the contact us page. It's like, well, don't load it on every page. It's quite a weirdly chunky SDK. I wish it wasn't, but it is. So can you load it just on the contact us page where you're using the web, uh, you're using the map? Um, or choices that you make, like um, ads are needed. They, they help pay for websites. Um, but are you serving the right number of ads? It is three ads on mobile better than 10 ads where the whole thing slows to a crawl. Um, tag Manager is a big one that people say, oh, it's Google. And I'm like, no, Tag Manager is a bucket. What you put in that bucket very much influences how fast DTM runs. So mm -hmm. have a look there and, and do a cleanup and that sort of thing. Um, so absolutely, third parties are a big cause of core web vector problems. But it's important to, to realize that they are your website and they're your problem and you've got to figure out what's the best way of dealing with it. Is it just, no, I'm happy with this functionality. Yes, I accept this form as an uh, issue with it and I'd rather leave it, but it's worth it to me. Or is it, no, we need to have a long, hard think with ourselves here. 
I, yeah. I wanted to add in the, in the WordPress ecosystem, we definitely see that where plugins may work well just by themselves, but when you load a website up with many, many plugins, you start to see conflicts or you start to see that they're actually causing performance problems when they're all together. And I think part of it too it has to do with what the incentives are, right? Like if, if you as a customer aren't complaining about performance, um, then the plugin developers have no reason to invest in it. And, and by and large in our ecosystem, um, we've judged which plugin to install based on which had the most features or the best features. So it's sort of a feature driven development is how we focus on things in core and, and WordPress in our ecosystem. And I think bringing up like the value of performance and user experience is going to help change that. So I, I totally agree with the idea that like you, you shouldn't just accept that it's a third party. You, you can choose another plugin, you can choose another provider, you can open a support ticket, you're a paying customer, try to get you know your upstream providers, as I call them, to, to improve because they they're on your site. So uh, if they aren't, if they're wrecking your user experience, then maybe it's time to take them off your site, you know, and not be a customer anymore. So that's the, that you need to make it a forceful argument to, to your third parties that they need to improve. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And we want the, the core web writing initiative. We want to make the web better and more, more pleasant to use. We don't care how that's done. And if it's, Third parties are, you know, everyone sitting there complaining uh, about it, and and that leads to improvements. Then that's great. It doesn't need to be your web developers hacking around things or working around things. If there is something um, that's slowing your website, it's probably slowing lots of other websites as well. So um, if you can get that fixed, or they hear one sport ticket, they're going to ignore it. They hear twenty or a thousand sport tickets, they're going to uh, pay attention. Absolutely, yeah, and also make sure to. Uh, monitor this continuously because uh, one day you might be checking this uh, third party this plugin and it might be working fine but uh, the other day it may have an update it may become slow or if it's a an external service it, you might not even realize that there has been an update but this part of your website became slow so just because you once checked uh, something don't uh, uh, think that it it will always be fast. It can be slow. So uh, if you're suspecting that something is slow, uh, just uh, even though you might have already checked it, double check it, it might have become uh, uh, slower with time and definitely again, raise the alarm. Awesome, thank you. Um, I think with that, now that we've covered why LCP is so hard to optimize for, Ivaiwa, I think you have some concrete tips and tricks for us on how to optimize for that. So maybe we can jump, jump into that. Yeah, definitely. And I'll try to be quick as it looks like we're having a power outage here. So, uh, all right. Let's see. Cool. Uh, we already covered uh, a lot of ground, but uh, and we learned that a lot goes into LCP. But uh, to make it easier, we're going to break it down into four stages, and we're going to look at a few ways we can optimize each stage, so we can overall uh, increase our chances of having a good LCP. Uh, first, it's your time to first byte. Uh, this is your uh, baseline for LCP. Uh, then there is the delay uh, before loading the important resources. Then the actual loading needs to be quick as well. And finally, you have to think about anything that might delay the rendering of your uh, of your content. Uh, so starting with the time to first byte, as I mentioned, this is your baseline. So if your if your TTFB is like uh, one second, for example, your LCP cannot be lower than one second. So uh, if your TTFB is half a second, your uh, LCP will, uh, will start from uh, half a second and up. So it only makes sense to try to have a, a, a low time first byte and be consistent with it. Uh, so a good host provider can definitely help uh, with consistency. Uh, caching, as we already mentioned, uh, is uh, another good strategy. Uh, using a CDN for serving your HTML is even better, especially if you have global audiences. Um, and uh, I, I believe Barry also mentioned the impact of redirects. They also count towards your TTFB, so make sure that you either uh, eliminate redirects or 
you just have uh, the minimal number, ideally only one. Um, and with this, we have a few examples. So we're going to work with the demo demo site here, and we're going to be examining the LCP of this website when we apply different uh, optimization techniques. And we're starting with the timed first byte optimization. Uh, by the way, we're looking here at the bottom uh, section of the console where we can lo look at our LCP values. So here we are going to load this website in its uh, bare form. It's unoptimized. Uh, and uh, right now it has a slow timed first byte. It's uh, sitting at 4.2 seconds. And our LCP in this, in this case is around 13 seconds. So just by uh, fixing the timed first byte and making it, uh, in this example, half a second, uh, we're going to see that we're going to uh, improve our LCP without doing anything else. Uh, there we go. We have uh, 9.2 seconds of uh, LCP. So as you can see, the difference between LCP with a uh, cached and non-cached ver uh, version of the website is exactly uh, the same difference between uh, the tenth first byte that we that we got here. Uh, next thing is you have to think about uh, providing hints to the browser uh, for your most important resources. So these are typically images, like we mentioned. So you can preload your LCP images. Fonts can also be uh, impacting your LCP if they are the largest uh, content. So preload your fonts if you're using custom ones. And uh, again, to iterate on this, don't uh, lazy load uh, your images in the LCP area. This can be counterproductive. Uh, again, we can see this with, a, with an example. Um, we're going to see this website a few times in this uh, presentation. But here uh, we have this website where we have the lazy loading uh, applied to every uh, image. And we don't have a, a preload for the the largest image here and as you can see our uh, lcp is uh, five seconds and then we have a version where we are preloading the uh, the hero image and we also don't have lazy loading for uh, the images in the lcp area so you can see this brought down our uh, lcp to 4.6 seconds just these two simple uh, optimizations uh, next we're gonna this is probably the something that everybody is familiar with, but uh, reduce the time that it, that it takes to uh, deliver your resources to the browser. So anything from uh, using a CDN, optimizing the images, optimizing your fonts. Uh, again, videos are typically very hard and challenging to deliver quickly. So uh, it's a good idea to avoid using videos as your main uh, content element. Uh, unless uh, you are kind of willing to uh, go on the journey of op optimizing, delivering uh, image uh, videos. So these simple things, uh, also using modern image formats, these are very important and can also uh, help you in improving your LCP. And finally, uh, you have the, the rendering stage and it can also be blocked by uh, different things, different render blocking elements. So uh, you have to think about uh, ways to, to remove those render blocking elements or to minimize uh, these delays as much as possible. Typically, you can create uh, critical CSS or you can uh, optimize your JavaScript, see which uh, are the most important uh, pieces, what's needed, what's not. Can you defer something? Can you delay it? Can you move it to an off thread? Or even if sometimes we see people that are still using, uh, still loading things that they're not using. So you can remove JavaScript as well. Uh, if, if you, for example, install the service uh, that you're no longer making use of, uh, just remove it. There's no need to ship it to, to the customers. Um, and this can be also a great, uh, this can have a great impact on your LCP as well. And just an, as an example with the same website that we that we have, uh, here we have applied all of the 
those strategies that we talked about. And you can see that with this, we are able to bring it down to under two seconds uh, for, for LCP on a simulated 3G network. So remember, we started with 13 seconds and with just a few simple things, all of these can be automated nowadays. Uh, we're able to bring it down to under uh, two seconds. Of course, these are lab tests and this uh, is not uh, uh, super indicative of what it, uh, it might be the real values that you might end up with, but definitely you are making steps in the right direction and you're optimizing things that uh, you should be optimizing. And with that, uh, I think we are ready for our Q&A session. I agree. Uh, thank you so much, Ivarol. I think you guys managed to give quite a 360 view of LCP. In the chat section, has literally been out of control during your presentations, and everyone's been really funny today. Uh, so I think everyone is excited to get their questions answered, and we can transition into the Q&A session. Um, so we have almost 10 questions here. Uh, the first one is, is a CDN really needed if your site is local and not global? Um, it really depends on your host oftentimes and of also what local means because uh, if we take, for example, the US local, does it mean you're serving the entire uh, continent of, uh, like the US you have, uh, this, these are very large distances. And in that case, a CDN can definitely help. But if, let's say, you're serving uh, a small area, uh, just a few hundred kilometers or about a thousand kilometer radius, it you might not need the CDN, but um, you will have to think about uh, the traffic that goes to your server. If you're not using a CDN, everything is typically going to towards your origin server. So if it's not able to uh, handle all the traffic, this might lead to slowdowns in general and uh, just provide poor performance to, uh, to, to your visitors. So I'd suggest CDN nowadays is uh, super common, very uh, affordable. I just, uh, many host companies provide it out of the box. So I just suggest you to uh, use CDN regardless. Don't think about it too, too much, like uh, pick a host that, that provides it out of the box. And um, I don't think you can go wrong with that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um... Like it used to be a CDN was a very expensive thing and you had to be a global multinational to afford some of these things. I think lots of hosting providers will include it by default. So you may already be using one without realizing it. Um, I think the other thing is check your audience. You may be surprised about where it's coming from. Um, so look at that and see what it is. But I think we've moved on from mostly having our own data centers and, and, and doing that. And any company that's sort of the size that can afford that usually will have a CDN anyway. So, uh, I mean, Cloudflare offers a free um, CDN option as well that you can put in front of no matter who your hosting provider is. So, no, it's not really needed, um, but it was a best practice now and also not something you struggle with whenever you want to scale. And it can offer other things like DDoS protection or, um, I say, offloading your, your from your origin site and just making it faster. Yep. And I noticed that uh, somebody asked whether Nitro Pack is a CDN. And in itself, no, but the CDN is part of NitroPack. So if you're using NitroPack, your resources are distributed through a CDN. Okay. Um, up next we have, doesn't NitroPack already make your images WebP? If I always think maybe uh, this yeah, one. Yes, it does. Uh, so what we do is uh, we keep uh, two versions of the images, uh, your original and the WebP version. So we serve the appropriate one to depending on the what the browser supports. Awesome. Uh, and then we have someone who wants to know if you have any suggestions for doing background videos, autoplay and the hero header or the top of the page. Uh, and they say that they're currently using a Vimeo embed and they just want to hit the proper LCP score. My biggest advice is don't. They look great the first time you see it, and you're like, wow, that's amazing. Well done, developers. But 
for uh, coming back to a website over and over. They're often quite distracting and annoying. So my first question is, is this a good UX pattern anyway, regardless of the performance implications of it? Um, once you go over that, the, the performance implications are quite big. Um, now, if it's full page background image, I mentioned it might not be eligible for LCP candidates, so it might not be important. But even then, like if you're on a slightly slower connection from your developer PC, again, it looks great. Try slowing it down, try working with, on mobile and seeing does it still give a good uh, impact. Or the other option is allow that on desktop, where people typically are a more stable connection, maybe connected with broadband. Um, and if your LCP um, uh, metric is fine with that, that's okay. Really question whether you want to do that on mobile. So maybe it's turned off on mobile and then there's questions about where mobile begins and tablets and, and, and so on. Um, but yeah, my biggest thing is, is it really what your users want? Or is it just, hey, we did this, we think it looks super sexy and cool and we're amazed that we could program it, can we keep it? Um, then maybe it's not the right answer. Yeah. And also it might be not, uh, if you're trying to predict how it's going to behave on the with the end user, it might actually not behave the way you expect. So for example, there are different restrictions in terms of video. So you'll be dealing with things like, can it actually outplay on mobile or can it not? Some browsers may allow it, some may not. So uh, you might think that everybody sees your uh, outplaying video, but uh, actually, many people might be just seeing a still image anyway. So you go through all this effort to to make uh, to make it load uh, in a performant manner, to make it work in the first place without playing everything, and then it, it might turn out that uh, most people are just viewing uh, the poster image anyway. So all right. Uh, then someone wants to know, are there LCP performance implications of using image carousels or is only the first frame considered? Yeah, so um, LCP works on elements. So if once the first element is done, if the element's not changing, um, it won't change there. So it, depending exactly how the carousel's implemented, um, it's you know, if it's replacing the image and um, a bit of JavaScript doing it, if it's swinging them in and left, then there, there can be uh, implications. Again, if the, uh, each element is the exact same size, then it shouldn't matter. Um, if some of the images are even a few pixels off, it can look like a bigger image and it can do that. The other thing with carousels is they tend to effectively all be not on screen, even though a couple are hidden. So you see a lot of them all trying to load at once and you might be slowing down that first image from loading, which is the main one that shows and then the other ones doesn't show. Um, but given all that, I'll also repeat my mantra and go back to the user. Carousels aren't great UX either. Um, there's lots of studies saying that most people ignore them or they'll look at the first image, a few will look at the second, hardly any will look at the third, and when you get into the fourth and fifth, no one's seen that sort of stuff. So they're quite often used as a, a way of Oh, 14 different departments all want to be on the homepage. We'll give them each a slide in the carousel. Trust me, the, the first one's getting the, what they wanted, the other 13, not so much. Um, so yeah, there can be some performance indication. Typically LCP is the first image that's drawn of that size. Um, so shouldn't be too bad in that sense, but they can just clash with each other. But again, is it really doing what you think it's doing regardless of the LCP uh, options? Okay, uh, and the next question is actually a bit of a contentious one. Uh, and this person says that he heard that f some people saying for a while that Nitro Pack is actually a hacky way of improving Core Web Vitals. And if I will, I'm curious about what you think of this one. Um, I, I don't know, uh, maybe we need some specifics, but uh, I mean, I know that uh, everything that we do is uh, like according to what we just talked about. Everything is, we're measuring things in, in RAM, we're measuring how the sites behave and whatever we do in terms of optimization and in terms of uh, like improvements is based on that. And these are also best practices. Uh, what NitroPack does actually is just being able to automate uh, a lot of what typically people do manually. So sometimes we've seen people just think that it's uh, some sort of a hacky way just because 
we are able to reach further and optimize more than what they're used to like if they have used a different solution previously or if they used to do something manually uh for example it, we've seen people for whom it's hard to believe that it can be automated so that's why i always suggest to try an automated solu automated solution and uh, see where it can lead you and then whatever is left you can tweak it you can do the manual stuff then but uh, tools nowadays are becoming more and more capable and it really doesn't make sense for you to spend time trying to optimize this manually or trying to use a tool that you have to uh, tweak a lot and you have to constantly uh, monitor uh, just use a modern tool and uh, figure out what your part in it uh, in its configuration needs to be or if you just need to tweak something in your website and you'll be good to go um, it really doesn't make sense to spend time nowadays to to optimize manually most of those things I, I would just add like I, I don't you can go next Barry I'll say something really quick just um, that you know regardless of whether it's the the approaches that NitroPack uses is hacky. One thing that I, I do see in our sort of WordPress ecosystem is that people tend to build out sites without any attention to performance. And then at the very last mm. minute, they add an optimization plugin in the hopes of bringing their performance to a good score. And one of the interesting artifacts of that is we see in the field metrics that often people who have optimization plugins perform more poorly than general word or regularly we see with optimization plugins where they perform more poorly and that's a selection uh, bias where basically people who have poor performing sites decide to install optimization plugins as sort of a band-aid and i think in that case you could sort of call it hacky in the sense that maybe uh, site owners are avoiding making some better decisions about what they're putting on their site or not overloading too many plugins and they're hoping that you know the that the optimization plugin will sort of fix their problems um, it's not really hacky, but it's kind of a, it's not really the best approach in the sense that we still need to pay attention to like without that optimization plugin, are you still at a good base level, um, or are you just trying to fix problems that you've already created? Yeah, I definitely yeah. agree with that. Yeah, Th but it so, doesn't make sense to, for example, manually create WebP versions of your images, right? Or to if yeah. we can automate LCP preloading. I mean, these things are dynamic. You want to build your pages and not have to think about which image should I preload or which font should I preload. If these things can be automated, uh, why not, right? No, I absolutely agree with that. And uh, kudos, by the way, for taking this question. You could have easily avoided it. Um, I have had some discussions in the last week or two where some of the settings in the pack, and, and I think they're under extreme settings or some crazy option like that, um, can do things like delay all the JavaScript. And that's generally a good thing to do if as long as your site renders. If nothing shows until your JavaScript runs and you're waiting for the user to interact before your JavaScript runs, then you've basically broken your site. And I'm not sure that's NitroPack's fault for enabling that thing. So whenever you enable these settings, check your site still loads there. If your LCP image isn't showing until the user clicks something and then it suddenly pops in, I'm not sure whether it's happy, but I, to me, you've broken the site and you've enabled one optimization too far and uh, maybe you want to look there at the at turning that ticker off or even better not make your site depend on javascript for the lcp and really depend on that on javascript afterwards um, as i say delaying javascript as long as you don't need it is a very good thing um, for for allowing lcp to load but delaying javascript when it is needed is obviously a very bad thing so we need to make sure that any plugin whether it's like whatever doesn't actually break your site or depend on something happening before it actually loads there. So again, you stick it through Lighthouse and it's like, oh, this site loads super fast, but none of the content's there. Yeah. Then, yeah, to me, you've just broken your site. So yeah. be careful with that sort of thing. Yeah, but also NitroPack is just a tool, right? Uh, we do have these presets, like uh, these are different modes of, this, this is your starting point, right? So our most aggressive starting point is uh, delay as much JavaScript as possible. Uh, but this is just a starting point. You can then go and tweak it and pick out the things that you need for your LCP or you, you, that are crucial to you. And uh, if these are going to be like the smaller subset, right? A and uh, ju just have this starting point, configure it and have your website perform as you expect. Or we do have other modes like uh, uh, that you can start off with all the scripts loading uh, normally and you pick the ones that you want to delay or the ones that you want to defer in some sort of manner. 
I, I see people often confusing this and they think that uh, they forget that Nitro Pack is a tool and that, of course, as much as we try to automate things and to guess what's supposed to happen, sometimes you do need to put uh, some manual configuration to make everything work, right? Much like with any other tool. Um, yeah, and I think that goes back to, to Adam's point of it's, it's, you can't just serve a band-aid on and they're expected to work. Yeah. Some things like web optimization, yeah. Other things, there are different settings there. Try and see what works on your website and actually see what it does. But mm. um, if you think you're getting better scores by d delaying your content, then why is the content there in the first place? So, um, yeah, just check any plugin that you put in that it's not causing a problem. Um, yeah. Just, uh, it's a tough one. Uh, but I also saw that uh, some people in the chat are, were discussing things like uh, sliders, and in particular, I think revolution was mentioned, but uh, those sliders can all also be like, they, they require a lot of JavaScript typically, and they do a lot of modifications to the uh, DOM structure before the slider is uh, rendered or the image is, uh, is rendered. So um, at Naturpack, we've also, uh, done a lot on that front as well. So for example, we know what these sliders do, what the, uh, and it's not only for these sliders, right? Uh, for a lot of elements, uh, we know what they do and what's supposed to happen. So we try to modify the content on the server side before uh, we serve it uh, so that the JavaScript from revolution slider is not needed to uh, show 80% of the content that's supposed to show, right? So that can greatly help, but it's not, like it's not you're not skipping the step of hey you still need the rest of the slider to load you still need it to to render a dynamic part to make it interactive and everything uh so yeah just wanted to add that thank you um up next we have uh do you have any tips for reducing third party code uh for reducing third party code impacts when all of the third party code are google yeah, I don't know if that was asked before. I talked a little bit about it earlier on. Um, one check when uh, you're actually using it. So I'll give that embed, map embeds example. Um, two check when it's loaded. Um, lots of third parties, Google included, say that this thing must be in your head and it must be important loaded right at the top. Question that, is your analytics more important than your content? Um, should the ads load before your content? Should they load later and stuff like that? So, web performance spikes typically is load stuff in the footer at the bottom um, because it loads last. Um, all third parties are like, we're super important and we want our things to um, be loading super quick, so they're going to say put it at the top. The answer is probably somewhere in between, in between uh, depending on what it is. Um, the other thing is raise these things to Google. I, I know I do when I, when I speak a lot of internal teams. So if you're not happy with um, Google Tag Manager or, or ads or, or maps or whatever, raise those on the forums and the sport forums and stuff like that. Let Google know because it'll make my job easier when I'm chasing them saying, please improve this and do that. Um, and then look, as I say, it's your site. Are you needing all this loaded um, at all the things? But the biggest thing you can do is delay it. And Google Tag Manager, have a cleanup in there. Is there hundreds of tags you're not using in there? Um, is there Google third-party code that you're not using anymore. We don't use recapture anymore, but we still load it on every single page because we've got to take it away. Um, so audit your site, have a spring clean clean up. That's the biggest advice I can get and raise these issues. All right, thank you. Uh, why is there a difference in score in different tools like PageSpeed Insights and Lighthouse? So I'll say that. So. Um, Lighthouse um, doesn't measure what your real user stuff is. It does a, a, a test under specific conditions. Usually, particularly for mobile, we try and slow it down. We try and give you a slow load and say, this is what the slow load would look like. If you are on the latest MacBook Pro M2 Mac, slowing that down, um, we do like a, a four speed slowdown of your, of your PC, compared to an ancient Mac or um, Windows machine, whatever, and slowing that down, they're going to be very different. Similarly, PageSpeed Insight runs on a server, so they're mostly similar. Um, so that's one good way of, of checking there because they should be roughly the same. Um, but we also see 
that you can run uh, uh, Lighthouse in a, uh, a continuous integration environment. Again, the, the servers you run it on varies. GitHub um, actions are fantastic. I use them all the time, they're brilliant. But the servers you get vary considerably um, because it's free service. They might be super fast, they might be super low, uh, slow or something like that. So some of the speed audits will see a lot of variability. And you can try and work around that by running multiple times, taking the median and that sort of thing. Um, but you will see differences. Also, whenever you've got extensions installed, um, that will slow down. So again, sometimes it's better running it in uh, incognito mode or on a, 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 have a guest profile or a fresh profile that doesn't have any extensions or this sort of thing. But there is naturally going to be some variability. So it does measure the time things. And those, those time things change depending on what else is going on in the machine, what else is going on in the network. It, and it is a guess. So some of the other audits it does, like SEO audits and accessibility audits, they're going to be the same every single time because it's just looking at the way things do it. Performance is particularly very susceptible to, because um, it's measuring time, how much that time changes. And you know yourself, sometimes you'll um, load up a web page and it'll be fast, and sometimes it's the exact same web page, two seconds later it's slow. Because I don't know, your know, kids are on YouTube in the next uh, door, um, stealing all your bandwidth, or uh, your PC's just uh, doing lots of work and it's slow. So there's a lot of variability in your thing, and Lighthouse is no, uh, you know, is susceptible to that. The best thing you can do is use it through a service like PHP Insights or any of the online services that do it that kind of try to adjust that variability. But there's still going to be some variability there. Yep, and also uh, try to use only one. Pick pick one tool or one service that you're going to use and always use that one. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense to compare different services just because even even though they might all run Lighthouse, the conditions are going to be different. So you cannot really compare results there. That's, that's a great advice. And particularly if you're looking at um, reproducing a performance issue, run it on your test site, make your changes, run it again. Don't compare your production site through PageSpeed Insight with your dev site through um, DevTools Lighthouse. They're very different setups. So try and use the same thing and do a relative comparison of, oh, it's got better, it solved the issue, it's not, rather than this other tool showing this, this tool not, I fixed it, even though you haven't touched a single line of code. OK. Uh, up next, we have, should you generally use an image overlay for embedded video for embedded videos on a page? I think that would be the facade uh, thing. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I think yes. It, depending on uh, where you you need the the video and what your intention is, is generally, I think, a good idea to use this. Um, yeah, I'd agree. And then YouTube uses it itself. You get a poster image or whatever, rather than the full video load, loading first. Mm -hmm. So in general, yeah, try not to load the video um, in total. Um, Okay. Uh, how do you gauge a loading threshold for lazy loading your site? Is this, if you're lazy loading, I'm presuming this is if you're lazy loading images, we try, so off screen images won't be loaded as they get near to the screen, they start to be loaded. And the question is, what's your definition of near? I think that's what the question is. Um, honestly, my thing now is, let the browser deal with it. So we have native lazy loading. You just put loading equals lazy on your attributes and it takes care of it. Now, some of the browsers have different thresholds. Um, I think Firefox is a very uh, small threshold, um, which means it loads less images, but does mean that occasionally when you scroll down, it's not finished loading there. So there's a balance there. I quite like Chrome's one, but I'm totally biased because I work in that team. Um, but there is no control for native lazy loading. None of the browsers offer an option with that. Um, you just do it. Before that came along, we had a lot of JavaScript libraries to do it, and they offer a much level, greater level of control. And if you want that level of control, do use those uh, JavaScript libraries. Um, however, that's loading extra JavaScript, and it needs to be executed, and it takes a while to, uh, to load, and it's overriding some of the defaults, so it doesn't use set a date source around the source attributes, so the browser doesn't even know it's an image until later. So my general thing is use the browser's default. It's built into the browser now. It's generally good enough. People are used to it. They, see the same thing from site to site. It may not be your personal preference. You might wish it was loaded later or earlier. Um, but whenever people are going from site to site, because it's quite common now, it's um, usually what they would expect. So I wouldn't bother trying to guess or set a threshold. 
um, and just let the browser deal with it. Video is one that we don't have an insertion for, and we might need the JavaScript there. To, I mean, you can sort of figure that out depending on the size of the video. But for images and iframes, using the native routing uh, from browser. And I was going to add, Barry, also, if it, Chrome detects like a low bandwidth connection, it increases that threshold so that the, Im the images will have more time to load. So that's a nice kind of feature of the native lazy loading is that it is sort of bandwidth specific. Yeah, which is an interesting one because. Again, Chrome prioritizes, we want to try and get this loaded. So it's a seamless um, experience for the user. Other people say, if it's low bandwidth, maybe we should reduce that thing instead and stop using up the bandwidth. So it's a question of where you go there. But again, I quite like Chrome's implementation because yeah. I'm biased. I remember when we landed the feature in WordPress core, we had someone open an, an issue. They came to us and they said, well, what I like, to, I'm in a low bandwidth environment. What I like to do is I load the page and then I just wait. I let all the images load. And then once it's loaded, then I scroll through and read the article. And by adding lazy loaded, we messed up that user's experience because now those images don't load for him. He has to like scroll through the whole thing to get them all to load and then wait. Um, but it's you know, it's just every user is going to have a different experience. You're shooting for that 75% threshold of giving the vast majority of your users a good experience. Yeah, it sounds like they were working around the per experience anyway. Exactly. Um, and I think maybe we can take one more question because we've already gone over time. Um, is using a background image as opposed to just an image bad for LCP? So it can be because an image, um, the way the browser loads is it gets HTML. And that's the first thing it gets. And it sits there and tries to work for it. If you've got an image in there, it will try and uh, get it. If you've got a div there and the background images is in a CSS file, or even actually if it's in a style element within the div, the browser doesn't read that um, until it's finished processing all the CSS and seeing if that images have been overridden in some other bit of CSS. So um, yeah, you, it will generally discover that late. Um, so going back to some of those charts that Valia showed, you'll get a big delay before it even starts downloading the image, which then means that you're delaying your LCP. Um, workarounds for this sort of thing where, where the image isn't found because it's in CSS or because it's in JavaScript is to use a preload tag um, to try and say, hey, you're going to need this image. Um, browser, go ahead and download it. You don't know where yet. You can't see it from immediately reading the HTML, but trust me, you're going to need this. Then another important thing is to keep those in sync. Once you get that, it's generally um, not too bad. Um, but just using a background image without a preload can be considerably worse than using um, an image tag. And also semantically, like from what should be right and what screen readers will use and what um, things like um, Apple's reader view or Safari's reader view is, an image generally tends to appear in those where the background image will just vanish. Or printing, that's another one. You print a page with a background image, typically they don't print, whereas if it's an image image, then it will print. All right. And I think with that, we can wrap up session number three of our webinar series. And we're taking a short break until early next year when we'll return for part four. Looking ahead, the fourth and final part will take place in January 2024. And it's going to be dedicated entirely to instant page loading. We promise to start the new year strong, offering a deep dive into innovative instant page loading strategies. Together, we'll explore how to leverage pre-fetching, pre-rendering, and back forward cache to guarantee seamless navigations once users land on your site. So I think you'll want to stay tuned for that one. And before we call it a day, please don't forget that you're more than welcome to connect with us. Any place you're active online, such as LinkedIn or Twitter, we'll be more than happy to continue the conversation with you. And any, conversa uh, and any questions that we weren't able to uh, answer today, we'll answer via email, and you'll also get the recording uh, via email. So thank you again for joining us, and you, we hope you found this useful. And we'll see you in January. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.